Yeah. All right. <coughs> so, uh, I'm Adam Blackwood, and I am the lead interviewer. Uh, I'm Colin Grappi. I am the associate interviewer. I'm Matthew Sikorsky. I am the camera guy. And, and uh, this is my great great uncle, uh, Mr. Tommy Grappi, uh, brother of Father Jim Grappi, and we're here to interview him today. Okay, so I understand that uh, you were born in 1933 in Milwaukee. Um, what was it like uh, in your childhood? Oh, it was a very, very good childhood. I was fortunate. I was born into a good family. I had good parents, a lot of brothers and sisters, and <clears throat> the neighborhood was outstanding. We, it was just, I don't know what you want to call it. Uh, most of us were all of Italian descent, you might say, but, but uh, still, it, it was a great neighborhood. And uh, <clears throat> growing up, I think, in that, that period of time was so much simpler than it is today. Today, it was so complicated with all electronics and everything else going on. In those days, you made your own fun. You know, if you had friends, you had, we had enough guys for baseball teams and whatever else we wanted to play. We always had extra, too. There were so many kids in the neighborhood. We used to play ball in the street, you know, either football and use the tar lines for the goal lines and whatnot, and baseball. There were no cars parked on the streets. Nobody had cars back then, or the majority of them. So it was, then we had a playground two doors away from me, <coughs> although it was all cinders at the time. We spent hours and hours in there playing. If we didn't have the playground, we had the whole lake. We'd go fishing or swimming. It was always a block away from my home. Spent a lot of time down there. Then the Illinois Steel Mill was all closed up at the time. It was a big open field down where <coughs> the Navy base is right now. From Russell Avenue all the way to Jones Island was all open fields. And that was another playground. Chase rabbits and pheasants and whatever else was down there. And there was a lot of... Uh, <coughs> Leftovers from the steel mill, a lot of scrap iron. And during the war, <coughs> people, kids, grown-ups, wagon loads of scrap metal coming out of there, taking it all to the junk dealer and getting good money for it. You know, times were tough on a lot of people. But uh, like I said, we had plenty of room to play. We had Louisville Playground. That occupied a lot of my time. Baseball, basketball, or just in general fooling around. Then we had the playground across the street. <coughs> when I went into service, it was still there. It was called Conway Street Playground. And we had a hardball diamond on this end here on the uh, southwest uh, corner. In the middle of it, we had a softball field. Then on the end, on Logan and, uh, and Lincoln Avenue, there was another softball field. Played Stars of Yesterday Baseball across the street. Then I went into service in 1953. I came home. They had an Army Reserve Center built right on our playground. <laughs> so that ended that. <clears throat> but uh, a lot of my time, aside from working in the family store, we spent a lot of time in uh, sports, baseball, basketball, whatever else was in season. And like I said, uh, we had an awful lot of guys in the neighborhood that I grew up with, and, and many of them are still around. But... Uh, all we think about is the fun we had growing up, and it was it was unbelievable time, you know. Although we had Second World War, and after that the Korean War, which many of us went to and went in the service for, but uh, it were unusual times. All my friends say that they we we grew up in the best of times, and I believe it today. As I look back, it was really something else. So. Uh, uh, I don't know, after that, you know, you're working in the store all your life and it was a family-operated business, so there were no, you know, you worked morning till night and I was never overworked, you know, <laughs> although I thought I was, but they didn't force me to work. You know, you just, you did what you had to do in a family business. My brothers, older brothers, Johnny, Louis, Mario, and Father Jim, they all, and my sisters, they all worked there too. My wife worked there and it was uh, very rewarding. I look back and think, well, maybe I should have went on to college and did this and did that, but as I look back, I, I made more friends in that store and learned more about people and their lives and 
all different walks of life. Life, you know, they, we had a, a time when uh, basically the neighborhood was uh, immigrants, mainly immigrants, Italians, mainly northern Italians. All we did have, oh, I can think of at least a dozen or so Sicilian families there, but we had a big Croatian population, Polish, German, and the Irish were up near our parish, but uh, we had a real mix, and Mexican families also, which I had a lot of good friends with. But uh, then we had the, uh, when the uh, St. Lawrence Seaway opened up about 1960, <clears throat> and Jones Island was a hotbed for workers. They had dock workers come, oh, they used to have maybe I'll bet you three, four hundred people. I think there were twenty men on a crew. They used to have maybe twenty crews down there working on his ships. In those days, it wasn't containerized, so a lot of it was bulk loaded, and you had to handle everything by hand. And that, and we had a lot of uh, African Americans that worked down there. And I got to know, oh, geez, quite a few. And their names still are pop up in my mind. But they used to get paid <coughs> every day for the previous day's work. So we'd cash their checks every day. I think we were cashing more checks than the local bank was doing. We had quite a gang coming in. Then there were a lot of, uh, that was a hippie generation too back then. We had a lot of them working on the island. It was very entertaining. We had quite a gang of people and a real mix of life from all, all over. So I say it, uh, it, it was a, a good experience, real happy experience. And, and we used to deliver groceries too, and <clears throat> my brothers did it, and I did it, I think, for the longest time, and that's why I got a bum shoulder now, among other things. But, but you know, now all the big stores, oh, we'll deliver this, we'll do that, uh, online, so forth, so on. We were way ahead of them, but it burned us out too. It was a lot of work doing that. <laughs> Anyways, we could do it as long as we could, and we were happy doing it. The only way you could buck the big stores, you had to offer service, you know, and credit. <coughs> My father started out, and he had nothing. When he came over from the old country the first time, he had the equivalent of $12 in his pocket. Then he went back to Italy and came back, worked in Chicago for some of the bakeries down there. And then uh, <coughs> he went back to Italy and got his bride-to-be, my mother, and he came back, and they were married in Chicago back in 1913 <coughs> at Our Lady of Pompeii Church. And then it was a double wedding. Another couple got married with them. And then I believe they stayed in Chicago for a while. It, then mo No, they moved up here then, a little place on a corner where we were. It was a house, just enough for a little grocery store, a little store. You sold everything under the sun. <coughs> Hardware, clothing. Anything people needed, he had for them. Because we had the Illinois Steel Mill was going pretty good at that time. They'd all stop there for their lunches, <coughs> their food, and so forth. And so that kept them going for a long time. Then his family was growing. They had hard luck. Their firstborn, Clemente, he uh, passed away shortly after birth. <coughs> and then the next year, 1915, my brother Johnny was born. And then uh, 1916 was my sister Eleanor, 1918 Teresa, Louis 1919, Mary was 1922, Franny was 1924, Mario was 1926. Oh, Franny had a twin brother, Frank, who passed away about seven months after birth. And then uh, Mario was 1926, then came Gloria 1929. Father Jim, 1930, and I was the last one, 1933. So he had a lot of mouths to feed, and they worked hard. My brother Johnny, I think he started driving a truck when he was 12 years old, and he was helping out in a store. <laughs> My father used to push a cart, <coughs> a push cart, from a, the store on the corner of Russell and Wentworth, all the way downtown to Broadway, the Commission Row. He'd buy all the fruits and vegetables and whatever other food or a haberdashery. He'd come home with clothing and everything else and sell that in the store. He used to sell, you know, socks, overalls, coveralls, jackets, anything you wanted. He had it. Oh, kerosene we sold for all the lanterns and turpentine we had also. And, <coughs> and we had the, uh, 
backyard we had the uh, chicken coop, you might call it. We raised chickens and for sale, you know, the customers come buy a live chicken. Well, if they want to take it home live, they could. Most of them would say, well, kill it for us. So either wrung their neck or Johnny would, you know, cut the throat and hang it on a hook or a doorknob somewhere. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> well, we had turkeys, geese, ducks, rabbits, pigeons. Louis, my brother, Colin, your great-grandpa, he was a pigeon flyer. And uh, Mario also flew pigeons. We all helped out. I used to train them and whatnot. And, but, in fact, Louis got in a signal corps. And uh, initially he was with the, <coughs> what they call it, the Pigeoneers. <coughs> they still use pigeons for communications then in World War II, the early part of the war. So he was attached to the signal corps with the pigeons. <coughs> he was all over South Pacific, Philippines, New Caledonia. Then I think he ended up in Japan. My brother Johnny, he ended up in Europe, all through Europe. And... Uh, <coughs> Mario, I guess he ended up at Fort Lewis, Washington, <clears throat> and I ended up, I was drafted during the Korean War, but fortunately the fighting stopped when I was taking a basic training down at Camp Oak, Louisiana. So I went over in October of 53 and I went to school in Japan at a Jima Specialist School. It was an old Japanese Naval Academy down the inland sea. It was just beautiful. And from there I went to Korea, I think it was the end of November, early December. The war was over for a few months already, but uh, I was fortunate there. <coughs> I ended up, I was, I was at, uh, attached to 8th Army Headquarters in Seoul, Korea. And uh, it was a, uh, a staff section. I was in the sports section and whatnot, whatever you want to call it. But we took care of a lot of the entertainment. Also, USO troops would come through, and and uh, occasionally a movie star would come in. In fact, they had Marilyn Monroe, but I didn't get to see her. It's the other guys in the crew went, <laughs> and Raymond Burr was in there. And <clears throat> but uh, uh, you know, the war was over. They had to keep us busy, so we had a lot. Spent a lot of time, you know, uh, playing sports, baseball and basketball, whatever else kept us busy, and and uh, it was. Uh, you know, a real experience, I might say. Went on R&R &R a couple of times to Japan. That was nice, too. We went to uh, Karatsu Seaside. That was there. Then we ended up in Tokyo and Yokohama. I went a couple of times, and I went up to Kurosawa up in central Tokyo. Ah, Tokyo Central. Uh, the island was uh, Hanshu, the main island. But uh, And traveling around was really... Uh, something I enjoyed doing then. At my age, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> but but uh, I don't ever regret being in the service. In fact, uh, it got me out of the store and out of the neighborhood, and all my friends were all over somewhere else, too. My brother Johnny, he never would have left the neighborhood if he didn't get drafted. So, But uh, like I say, fortunate we all came home. No problems. Uh, <clears throat> uh, then I met my wife. I uh, I got out of the neighborhood of time. A friend of mine and I, we went up to a friend of mine. His sisters got married downtown, and, and the other guy said, hey, he says, I know the bartender up on the north side at this place. So <laughs> we went up there, and uh, my future wife happened to be there, and and we kind of hit it off pretty good right off the bat, you know. And, and she came down to Bayview here, and pestered me a lot until I caught her. <laughs> but uh, she was something else. She was the big turning point in my life. I was very fortunate to have her. And uh, we got married up in Michigan, the Upper Peninsula, small town of Caspian. It was right outside Iron River, Michigan, uh, St. Cecilia's Church, May 7th, 1960. My brother Jim, he was ordained the year before, and he married us up there. And from there, we went on our honeymoon. We drove from up there all the way out to Las Vegas, and uh, had a had a good time. But uh, had her for 49 years, and uh, well, she ended up getting Parkinson's, and for about a dozen years, it was kind of a 
rough on her, you know, <clears throat> did my best to take care of her. And as I think back, I can't even remember half the things that we did, you know, and uh, you just do it as a matter of routine and, and excuse me, I'm gonna blow my nose a minute. <laughs> but uh, somehow or other, she, she survived 12 years and then uh, only spent a week in a hospice and passed away. <clears throat> as I look at the house, I think she's still here. <laughs> I'm sure. But uh, other than that, uh, I wanted to uh, give a little family history, if it's all right with you. <clears throat> My uh, parents, that was Giacondo Gruppi, and my mother was Georgina Gruppi. Her maiden name was Magri. And uh, they were both born in Italy, the same little town, Falecchio. <clears throat> it's close to the uh, bigger city of Barga, which is all a part of uh, uh, the province of uh, Lucca. That's all in Tuscany. And uh, <clears throat> my grandfather was uh, on my father's side, Clemente Grappi. My grandfather, grandmother was Maria Grappi. On my mother's side, it was Pietro Magri and Elena Magri. My father was born January 1st, 1884. My mother, July 8th, 1890. Uh, they were married in Chicago, I don't know, I mentioned it earlier, October 26, 1913. <clears throat> and I mentioned that my wife and I were married up in Michigan. My wife's family were uh, from Calabria, Italy. I think the town was uh, Cantanzaro. That was Paul and Carmela Mangoni. Oh, yeah. Oh, my mother's family moved to Brazil. She was only two years old. I think it was 1892. The whole family moved to Brazil. I think it was Rio de la Clara, something like that. It was near Sao Paulo, but at that time it was pretty primitive too. And uh, in fact, I think one of my cousins said they were, the men were kind of like cowboys or whatever, you know, out in the forest and, and the horses and that. But anyways, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the family split then about, she was there about 10 years. She came back to Italy with part of her family. Part of the family stayed in Brazil. So she came back about 1902. <clears throat> yeah, we kind of lost contact with the family during the Second World War. But uh, recently I've been looking it up and I found some Magris down there in that particular area on my mother's side. In fact, one of them had to be a great niece or niece or something because one of my brother's name was Luciano Magri. And this particular woman, she is uh, Luciana and her middle name is Di Pietro Magri. You know, my mother's father was Pietro, so this has got to be a relative somewhere down there. And there might be quite a few. But anyways, that's the only, I didn't get in contact with her, but I uh, saw that. <clears throat> and my father passed away in 19... 56, he was 72 years old. And my mother died in 1985, and she was 95. She died a month after my brother Jim. And, uh, well, my wife's family, there were eight kids. Parents were Paul and Carmela Mangoni. Children were Danny and Connie. They were both born in Italy. <clears throat> and then it was Rosie, Antoinette, my wife Violet, Genevieve, Michael and David. That's my wife's side. Uh, and I mentioned about Jones Island. <clears throat> oh, aside from the workers down the docks, we had a lot of the uh, the sailors, the men on the ship, all different countries. <clears throat> Korea, Japan, Taiwan, and we had many from Europe. And here, you know, I grew up with all the people speaking foreign languages in a store, and you, uh, 
you get to speak broken English just like they do. It kind of grows on you. Well, anyways, I remember one day we were in a store, and I, they were, I forgot where they were from. There were some foreigners in the store from what ship, I don't recall. But I was trying to get through to them something or other, so I kept talking louder and louder. My daughter, who was clerking also, she said, Dad, they can hear it. They just can't understand you. you know, so I just kept talking. Well, anyways, we settled it. We got most of it done. Some of them used to come in. They ran the ships. They would come in, and they wanted to feed the men on, on board. So they'd come right in, buy a lot of meats. They'd walk right into the big cooler and tell my brother Johnny, they want this. It was a hind quarter of beef or this. They'd clear out that cooler. You know? <laughs> so, and they'd take it all back on board ship. And, uh, and uh, one time I remember... <laughs> I sold one of them, I don't know what it was, a case of pears or something, and this was late November or something, one or the other, and they were heading back out to see. They got as far as Cleveland. Somehow they couldn't get through because of ice or what. It must have been later than that. They ended up coming back in the store again. He says, those pears were no good. <laughs> so I had to give them another case of pears, whatever it was there. But, oh, it was a very interesting neighborhood, and... Uh, characters oh my goodness you know I could go on and on but it was uh, so entertaining people all walks of life and they'd come to the store to get all the local news and uh, in fact some would call and ask hey what time is the next mass they didn't want to call the rectory you know they'd call the store uh, but uh, well I don't know I think I talked you got any more questions here for me right now Go ahead. Anything well, else? Go. Well, yeah, we were going to ask what schools did you go to? Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, Immaculate Conception Grade School. I went there. Most of the family went there. In fact, I think we all went there. And then uh, from there, I went to Bayview High School. <coughs> Although, <coughs> I had a, a small scholarship to St. John's Cathedral downtown. I went there a couple of weeks, but I... I uh, I couldn't stand getting on a streetcar or to go down to school or the bus or whatever it was. And so I transferred to Bayview. All my brothers, you know, they all went there and sisters and whatnot. And I said, why go to Elon Town? I could walk a couple blocks. I'm at the school. So I went to Bayview High School. I graduated in 1951. Then I tried, then I went to, oh, they don't call it UWM. I went to the University of Wisconsin Extension Division downtown. We had classes in different buildings down there for about a year. But then I, I came back and to the store, and then I got drafted. But uh, that was the school part of it. And then I went to school in the service. I never really used what I learned. But uh, I think that was my education there. But most of it was just learning from people I dealt with every day. Um, so when you got drafted, yeah. um, well, I mean, what was probably the most impactful thing that came out of your time in the service? Well, <clears throat> just going to foreign countries and so forth, learning and meeting a lot of people. I mean, even overseas I met people I... I knew from Bayview here, or from other parts, the city and so on. Uh, but I think I was, and when I got attached to this outfit, you know, I, it, I was pretty lucky. You know, it was, it was a headquarters and we had facilities there. We had a PX and we had a, a big gym there. And in fact, they used to have the uh, big tournaments there from the, what they call AFI, that's the Armed Forces Far East. All the big basketball tournaments were held there. Teams from Japan would come and play, teams from Korea. In fact, I saw one guy went to Pulaski High School, played for one of the teams from Japan. He was very good. And then we had uh, boxing matches. Oh, boy, you used to have boxing in your service, too, and watch all those in the gym. And we had a big uh, PX there, and we had a chapel was like a jumbo Quonset hut. One time, uh, Cardinal Spellman came over for Christmas and said Mass there. And, oh, and then one, uh, we had a, uh, <coughs> this was in the summer of 53, no, 54. Uh, <coughs> we had a tennis 
uh, not a tournament, you might say, they were on a tour. <clears throat> it was Jack Kramer and you had Pancho, Gazzura, Pancho Segura and Pancho Gonzalez. They were the best in the world at the time. They came over to Korea, put on a, a big show over there, they're making a tour around. And the president of Korea was there, Sing Min Ri. I got some pictures of him, so forth. We had to set it all up for him anyways, but uh, that was interesting. But other than that, uh, they tried to keep you busy. Played a lot of ball. Oh, I had some officers that I worked for over there were, uh, one of them was from Racine. He was Major Miller, F. Don Miller. And, uh, well, you know, he was good. He was good. Uh, we used to play ball against officers, against uh, enlisted men, and he used to pitch for them. And he had a, not a windmill, a figure eight pitcher, fast pitch. But I got to know him pretty good. And uh, then after the war, or after the service, <coughs> I happened to be watching TV one day, and he said, oh, the new executive director of the U.S. Olympic Committee, F. Don Miller. Well, you got a, a pretty good <laughs> number there, too. But we had another officer there. Was, uh, <coughs> he was a lieutenant colonel. Uh, Sage, Jerry Sage. Guy couldn't sit still. He jumped all over the place. Now, he always wanted to go, ready to go, do something. Well, he was, uh, he came from a regimental combat team. He saw a lot of action. In fact, in World War II, uh, he said this movie, oh, I don't know if you remember it, they, The Great Escape, they called it. It was about some guys were captured in the service, PWs. And he swears that movie was made about him. And it was a big article in the newspaper I got in the other room there. So how many times he tried to escape and whatnot. Uh, what did they call him? The cooler? I don't know what they call him, but he had quite a reputation. And he kept us moving all the time, too. You know, it wasn't volleyball or basketball or something else. So <laughs> we kept busy. Uh, there were a lot of guys I met in the service. <coughs> Going over on a ship, I met a lot of people, and that was in itself an experience, you know. And it was a big troop ship. We had 4,500 men on there, and and uh, what do you do on there? You play cards or whatever and so forth, and they, they try and keep you busy, but it was, uh, oh, I got sick on there twice. <laughs> uh, but other than that, uh, I can't knock the service. Except one when I when it was time to get uh, <coughs> when I was getting uh, discharged, we had to go back to Fort Sheridan. In fact, I had to come home. My father got sick, and I had to come home on emergency leave. So there were a couple of friends of mine who I grew up with. They lived a couple miles south of me. They were in a in an ordinance uh, group over there. They go around picking up captured enemy weapons and whatever else there was to do. One was Paul Fair. I grew up with him and I went to school, to grade school with him. The other one was John Dugan. <laughs> and I went to grade school with him too. Oh boy, he, big redhead. He was not. He was a barrel of fun. Both of them. Well, I used to walk down and visit with him for a while down there. And, and I got called home on emergency leave and I don't know how they got wind of it, but anyways, Morning, I was leaving. John Dugan pulled up in a jeep, picked me up, and he drove me over to Inchon. And I stayed overnight with another high school friend of mine in Inchon, and then I flew out of there the next day and and uh, back to Milwaukee. Then I think I had a month or two left in the service, so I they uh, discharged me out of Fort Sheridan. I think I came out a month or so shy of two years, but when I got discharged, I. Uh, <coughs> Well, I had to go up to the desk over there. One went this way, one went that way. I went over to this guy uh, who was sitting on the other side of the desk. Another guy I went to high school with, Jim McKinnon. His father owned a pharmacy down on Delaware Avenue. And uh, he discharged me. And and uh, he re I think I he died recently of a heart attack or something. I used to see him at our reunions. But the funny thing is that uh, <coughs> Jim McKinnon, Dick Marino, and my brother Jim, priest. The, uh, they were all going to join the army. Well, I was already in. I was down in Louisiana taking basic, but they come up with an idea they're going to join the service. Dick and Marino had a bad case of asthma. He couldn't make it. My brother Jim, I think the local, I think my pastor I think was Father Ryan, and he was a former army chaplain. In fact, he was the 82nd Airborne all during World War II. And I think he talked him out of the service, so Jimmy didn't go either. The only one was Jim McKinnon. 
So anyways, but yeah, our uh, pastor at Immaculate Conception was uh, <coughs> Father David Ryan. And he was, uh, in fact, his sister was our principal, Sister Mary Lawrence, Sisters of Mercy. Well, Father Ryan was in the, I think it was the 82nd Airborne. I still take care of his grave at Mount Olivet out here with flowers and whatnot. But anyways, <coughs> he had a picture in his, in the, uh, in the uh, priest house over there. It was on the wall, and there was a picture of a bunch of officers at a big banquet. And two of them were leaning over, talking to each other. Both had big smiles. Father Ryan and General Eisenhower, <laughs> both, you know, so he must have been close to all of them too, but uh, he was quite a guy. So after the service, it was the store, and uh, that was it. So, uh, yeah. I, <clears throat> you mentioned that you were in the military service and that you worked at the Gruppy store. Was there? Did you hold any other jobs during your? No, time? no, no, no. I never did. Never outside. No. In fact, it was hard in a service because, ah, well, I wasn't taking orders and that. But uh, no, that was the only job I ever had. Really, was in the store. I worked there. When we were kids. We all started working so early that uh, <coughs> people say, "When did you start?" I say, "I don't remember." <laughs> you know, you walked in the house, you walked into the store, and uh, when you get your driver's license, that's when you really started working. You know, there was always plenty to do. You know, not only the cost, maintaining the equipment and shoveling snow and whatever else had to be done, painting and. Uh, but it was a, you know, it was like a family farm where everything is there and you got to do it one way or the other. <clears throat> but the, our customers were unbelievable. They were the, really great. I have one customer still living from years ago. She just turned 103 last week. <clears throat> she was, a, <clears throat> in fact, her mother lived 104. She was Croatian. Uh, the mother and parents were born over there in Croatia. Uh, the Bosnik family. Her name is Canning, Katie Canning. And uh, I just saw, in fact, I saw her yesterday at Mass. And uh, she's doing well for age, 103 years old, still sharp as a tech. Her mother was too. Uh, <clears throat> and then well, all the other ones, and oh boy, yeah, there were so many memories back there, unreal. I buried a friend last week, I went to see him, Gary. Well, his name was Amarico, but he changed it to Gary later on. His last name was Garafani. And uh, the day before Thanksgiving, I picked up my sister Frances because we all grew up. He lived across the street in the store. And his sister Norma and my sister Frances, they were like sisters. And so we went out there, and Franny and I were in the van for a long time talking before we went in. And we just talked over old times and laughed at all the people and all the different things, people that came in and uh, different experiences with them. And <coughs> and then uh, I got another one Monday, Funeral Monday. She's got to be 97 or close to it, and Magnarini. So I'm going there Monday, but all my friends are up there, you know, and not all my, I go to the AMVITs, AMVIT meetings, and I think most of us are you know, veterans of Korean War, and there's a few from the World War II, but most of them are gone. Our average age is well over 80 years old, you know, so, so it's a very interesting just to talk over old times with them. <coughs> uh, and the Garibaldi Society I belong to also. That, that's been going on. My and Pa belong there, and very, we just celebrated our 110th anniversary, I think it was. It's a... Uh, started out as a uh, benevolent, it's an insurance organization, it's a benevolent society. For the Italians, they moved to Bayview and nobody had insurance or anything else. They all banded together and uh, it's a mutual aid society yet. So when, uh, when they were sick, I think they used to get a dollar a day or something like that way back there. But you know, it's, uh, it's a pretty active uh, club yet. I enjoy it. We meet at Garibaldi's, Club Garibaldi on, on Superior and Russell. Meetings once a month. Ambits once a month. <clears throat> but growing up, you know, you belong to the Optimist Club and stuff like that. 
junior optimist at our old Beulah Britain Social Center was a converted firehouse built years and years ago. Well, now they got a new social center here, but we all grew up in that building. Little Cracker Jack gym we played in, oh boy, bounce each other off the walls. And <laughs> but it was a, a meeting place for all the immigrants in the neighborhood. They could go to school there, they could learn English and everything else, and it was really, really nice, great for the neighborhood. There's a memorial out there right in front of the old place. It's up near Puddler's Hall. That's another tavern on a corner. Used to be Barberry's years ago. They call it Puddler's Hall now. <clears throat> but out in front, there's a little triangle with a big monument built there for a couple of Bayview uh, men who were killed in World War I, two Italians. And uh, it's still a, like I say, a monument to them. We put flags up on Memorial Day and so forth. Uh, I don't know, it covers that, I think. But we spent a lot of time on Lewis Field Playground. Basketball, baseball, fast pitch, slow pitch. Played on the asphalt when we were kids. And But basketball, oh man, we could get in games there at night and you go all sweat it up, go down a lake and take a dip in a lake and wash up. <laughs> that was our shower. <laughs> go ahead. Hi, uh, well... Uh, you mentioned all the recreational activities that you took part in as a child. What was your religious life like? In your religious life? life? Yeah. Well, it was very much a part of our life. <clears throat> you know, the whole family. Well, my pa, you know, in the early days at our, our parish here, <clears throat> I mentioned it maybe. Well, anyways, in those days was uh, practically an Irish parish. And uh, the first pastor was Father Fagan. Anyways, and uh, he was very Irish. Well, anyways, uh, I don't think he looked too fondly on the Italians. And he more or less wanted us to go to our own churches in the Third Ward. And some people liked him. I was, I was too young. I don't remember him. Even We had Father Pierce later on. But uh, anyways, uh, my father and mother, they used to go down to Pompeii or St. Rita's. But we had a church. <clears throat> not a church, it was a, a shoemaker shop right across the store on Russell Avenue. And on Sundays, a priest would come in from St. Rita's or Pompeii, Italian priest, and say Mass for the Italians here in the neighborhood. And my father, he used to like to go over when he was driving. He'd go either to Third Ward or he'd go to St. Joseph Hots, he liked in different churches. He was very religious. In fact, my mother said when he was growing up that my father had designs on a priesthood. He was hard of hearing, very hard of hearing, and I think that was one reason where he wasn't accepted, or maybe they, they didn't. Uh, maybe that was one reason he didn't go. Well, anyways, uh, he met my mother, not met her, but they, like I said, they went to the same church in Italy, in a little town of Felicio. And in those days, the men sat on one side and the women on the other side. And my mother used to say, "I used to see your father." looking and smiling at me, church and all. <laughs> so anyways, they had very religious roots. And then uh, in Milwaukee here, well, like I said, we all ended up going to IC. Although I think my brother Johnny started out at Trowbridge and then ended up at uh, Macla Conception. But uh, all the way down the line, all the girls, Louie, me, all of us were, uh, I would say, uh, pretty religious. By today's standards, you might say, you know, we still got in our share of trouble, but uh, the church was always there. Nobody missed Mass. You saw the picture of your great-grandpa overseas. He was saying he was at ma not at Mass. We had, he was praying with a couple of the natives in New Caledonia and so forth, and, and uh, Mario Johnny. Saturday nights we went to Mass at IC. Well, Saturday nights because we were working Sundays most of them. When they, when they started Mass on Saturdays for the previous day, well, then we all started going on Saturday nights because we worked on Sunday mornings also. So you're going to church and <clears throat> it'd be my wife and I, my daughter, my sister Mary, and a bunch of her kids. Your great grandpa Louie and Vilma were with us. My brother Johnny was sitting across the aisle, everybody else there. And, and uh, we filled it, so it was uh, never missed a holy day or anything else. Uh, we all made our communion at IC, confirmation, 
And I would have been married there, but I was married up north. <clears throat> but the rest of my sisters and brothers all married there. Uh, I don't know what, I was never an altar boy. I don't know, I didn't have time for it or what. I don't know what it was. I was playing all the time. So <laughs> but, uh, uh, oh, yeah, they, oh, we used to have big processions and everything for the holy days. And we used to sing at Mass all the time. Then they were all Latin Masses, so we sang in Latin and everything else. And it was good, very, very moving. Uh, other than that, I guess it was pretty routine for the family there. And Jim, he went in a, first he went to Bayview High School. He went to Tech at first. I think he was there a year or so. Some of his friends talked to him and they're going there. He said, ah, he said it was too much like a factory. So he went to Bayview then, got through with high school, worked in a store for a year or two, and at least a year then somehow he got his calling to the priesthood. And then he went up north to St. Lawrence seminary up in Mount Calvary, Wisconsin. After that, then he transferred to, after he graduated there, he ended up here at uh, St. Francis uh, de Sales. And a lot of his classmates, oh, they all used to come over to the house. The house was full of young priests of a long time there. <coughs> uh, good memories, too. So, then he was ordained in 1959. Yes. All right. Uh, as we as we've all probably heard, on um, Father Jim was heavily involved in civil rights. Oh yeah, and definitely. How, yeah. how did that? How did his involvement and people's reactions to it affect your lives and the lives of the rest of your family? At, and well, the <coughs> there was a reaction, definitely. You know, he. Uh, I was well. You know, he got involved with the civil rights and everything first while he was in his seminary yet. He used to work in a day camp up there with the, up in, uh, uh, what do they call the House of Peace now. Father Gottschalk was there. Uh, he worked with them, and he used to bus these kids, drive a bus, take them to different playgrounds, keep them busy all summer long. So he got involved with them that way. <coughs> and then, uh, yeah, after he was ordained, he was at St. Veronica's for his first uh, assignment there. Then he requested to be uh, transferred up to the uh, St. Boniface in the inner core. So he went up there next, and while it was predominantly at that time a black neighborhood, old German neighborhood, but it changed. <clears throat> and so he was involved pretty much then. He, he saw their hardships and what they were going through. And in fact, you know, some one of his friends got out of the service, you know, come back from Vietnam and so forth. and and he wanted to move to a better neighborhood or rent and so forth. And he was refused most of the time because, he said, oh, what are my neighbors going to say? You know, well, that kind of got under his skin somewhat too. And uh, I think he always took the role of the underdog, even in our neighborhood here, you know. Maybe he felt the prejudice against the Italians more than other people, more than I did. Maybe I just <coughs> didn't realize it. But he saw how they lived up there and, they were getting pushed around and everything else. So he got very active in the parish and in civil rights. In fact, when he just got there, he asked me and a couple other friends of ours if we could go out and try and solicit memberships for the school there and so forth. So we went around the neighborhood and so forth, door to door and whatnot, and uh, a lot of them did come to the church. But at that church, when he was saying mass up there, was always crowded, always packed from all different, you know, not only blacks and whites you know, and different religions, a lot of Jewish people came too, which I remember. But uh, <clears throat> that's how he got involved in civil rights, seeing how they lived and how they were pushed around. So then he ended up uh, getting involved in the civil rights movement. There are many books written about him. And he went down to <clears throat> Selma, Alabama too. And uh, he was with Martin Luther King and he was in the march across that, oh, I forgot the name of the bridge down there too. But he experienced prejudice in the worst ways down there. You know, even when I was there in his service, uh, it was a Labor Day weekend and I went up to Shreveport and they had a big parade and everything else. And 
All you saw was Confederate flags flying all over the place, you know, this, this was in 1953. But uh, so he got involved pretty much in civil rights. And uh, while he had the commandos, but he also had a freedom house that he had where they all used to meet. Well, that was burned down, arson, somebody burned it down, I don't know who. Then he, uh, <clears throat> you know, he, they always had a tail on him when he'd come home, he'd come back home to the store and so forth. And they always had, you know, the police department had somebody tailing him. They'd park up, half up the street from the store and watch when he went in and went out. And he'd come home to rest, lay down, take a rest, come home to eat and everything else. And the chief of police used to follow him down. Well, anyways, it turns out that the police chief and his wife and daughter became customers of ours at the store. You know, it was funny, you know. While they were, Chief Breyer was uh, tough. I imagine he was, but, you know, he was from the old school didn't put up with any nonsense at all, so he was tough, hard-headed. My brother Jim was a stubborn, hard-headed Italian, too. So they uh, kind of locked horns a lot, and but, uh, uh, you know, it, it was tough times. Even the arch, well, at the store, some people gave us a hard time. We had a lot of threats and everything else, and most of the people had a little common sense. They let everything ride. A lot of them rode up and rose up in his defense and so forth. We may have lost a few customers. I think we gained a few too. So it was, uh, you know, just a matter of putting up with the best we could. So it, it was tough times. You know, the Archbishop Cousins, he gave him a lot of leeway. A lot of people are mad at him because he didn't back him more and didn't say this and that from the pulpit. But a lot of people were calling for him to be thrown out of the priesthood and everything else. The cousin says, well, I, I agree with his, with his understanding and motives, but I can't always agree with his tactics. So Cousins kind of let it ride and so forth. But like I say, I think he could have backed him a little better. So uh, it, it was a very, very tough times, you know. And, but he'd come home to rest a lot, and that was good. He so liked to go, yeah. What, what kinds of threats were received at the store. Like, oh, what burn, some of the things burn it down, do? so forth, you know. I told Jimmy, I said, you know, when I, I bought two new hoses. <laughs> but, but we had all kinds of threats. And you, you go someplace, somebody would open their mouth, didn't realize that you were a brother, start talking about him and cussing him out and whatnot. And it kind of got to you. Sometimes you had to hold your temper before you tangled with somebody. And, and uh, in fact, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, South Shore water frolics were down here. They were pretty big at that time. They were still going pretty strong on the lakefront, South Shore Park, and we used to have entertainment there. We had bands and whatnot, all kinds of entertainment. Then we had one guy, I'll never forget this. Uh, his name was Madman Michaels or something like that. He was on the radio all the time. Anyways, uh, he started singing up there one time, E-I-E-I-E-I-O, Father Gruppy's gotta go. Oh, boy, if I would have had tomatoes, I would have threw them at him, you know. But, I mean, you put up with a lot back then. It was a lot, a lot of hatred, you know. And then in the marches, oh, my goodness, came down Lincoln Avenue here, coming over to the viaduct down to Lincoln Avenue, and he was pelted with stones, rocks, bottles, everything out, cussed them out, and it, uh, it took a lot of, a lot of courage. But uh, then the police were trying to protect them, but they could only do so much. So that was tough. But like I said, it, uh, those are very tough times. Then he eventually married, you know, Peggy Rosga, and she was, she used to go down and vote her registration down south and everything else. She got involved very heavily in civil rights, got very close, and eventually they married. You know, they always say, well, he left the priesthood. You know, he never really left the priesthood. He was devoted to it till the day he died. And uh, he used to come home and say mass for my mother, you know, and anybody else that wanted to come. So, uh, like I say, uh, I, I still have questions about this celibacy ruling, and I think it should be optional. That's my opinion. You know, when he was sick, he had, uh, he had brain cancer, tumor in his brain. He had surgery for it, but it wasn't really successful. He was paralyzed, part of his body and everything else. And, and after that, he wasn't the same. And so he was already married then, but uh, he lived on the north side 
I forgot where, Ruby on Ruby Avenue up there. Anyways, his wife was teaching and she could take care of him, but when she wasn't there, <clears throat> there was a lot of former priests and their wives that were taking care of him all the time. Uh, these are all good men, all capable of carrying on their professions, you know, but they were married. My God, what's wrong with that? I, I couldn't believe it. I still can't believe it. Anyways, uh, they were a big help in the end there too. And he had three kids. I think you know that he had Anna. She just had her fourth child, and uh, oh, Chrissy and Matthew. Matt was uh, works with the DNR now. The other two girls are teachers. But Matt got wounded in uh, Iraq. Then he spent another tour in Afghanistan, and now he's with the DNR. He just got married. He's living up in. Uh, Trempolo, Wisconsin, on the Mississippi, still working with the DNR. His wife works with the DNR also. So uh, that's their families. Uh, how, how did the rest of your family feel about uh, Father Jim's and his actions? Work? And well, I can't speak for all of them. I think we all loved him as a brother, probably questioned a lot of his activities and so forth. But, uh, you know, I... Uh, I knew he was doing what he felt was right, and that was the main thing. I think we all did, and uh, well, what can you do? That's life, you know. You, I can't say none of my brothers really disagreed. Like I said, he'd come home. We, we were still brothers, you know, all the time, regardless of what was going on. And so, uh, yeah, your your great grandpa, he loved little Matthew, Jimmy's son, the youngest one there, you know. Every time he'd come in the store to give him slimy sandwiches, everything under the sun. So, uh, but no, I, I think they were, they knew what he was doing. I have a brother Johnny now, he was uh, <clears throat> in World War II also, he was in Europe. But when he was in the States here, he brought home uh, one of his uh, buddies from service, happened to be Japanese. Now here the Japanese Americans were, they, they were incarcerated out, you know, in the concentration camps, you can call them that during World War II. And this guy was a Japanese American. He was in the army with Johnny, and uh, Johnny brought him home one weekend. I'll never forget it. Nice fellow. I think his uh, name was Fujino. Sounded Italian. Fujino, yeah. Anyways, he ended up with this, <coughs> what they call a NIC regiment, all Japanese Americans. He was fighting in Europe against the Germans, and they had probably one of the most heavily casual, heavy casualties in all the outfits there. I think he lost a leg over there too. But Johnny was very fond of him. You know, he was Japanese too, and and he, we were fighting him. So uh, that, that was the neighborhood. You got along with people. I don't care who they were. You had to. <coughs> you know, we all pulled so many dumb things in our lifetime, but uh, that was it. And Louis, he got along with everybody. You know, <coughs> your grandpa Louis, when he was in New Caledonia, <coughs> I think he was a sergeant at the time, and it was right at, after the war's ending. And he still had all these pigeons. The officers were eating all the pigeons and everything else. Louis took all, <laughs> took all the pigeons. He went out, he gave them all the natives. He was giving them everybody all the food to eat, everything else. I think he got busted from sergeant back down to private. <laughs> but he had this heart, you know. Louis, Louis was good to everybody. He was like a Pied Piper, all the kids and the men. He could warm up to them all the time. <laughs> He always had some kid following around. <laughs> oh boy. But those were difficult times. And then, like I said, I think uh, we used to go to Mass up there at St. Boniface occasionally, bring my mother up there. And uh, one Christmas Mass I went to Christmas Eve. Oh, I couldn't get into the car. Locks were frozen. I had to go back to the church. I got a candle to warm up the locks and <laughs> I got out of there. <coughs> But uh, ah, Jim, he, he had a soft heart too. You know, everybody doesn't understand prejudice, but uh, somewhere it, it bothered him. So he uh, he did a heck of a job. You know, I don't know what he'd be doing right now. Ah, uh, yeah. So. Did you ever take part in any of the protests that you had? So no. <coughs> no, I never did. No. Nope. Never did. We had a kind of say. Well, I don't know what he's going to do, but we got to stay here too. You know, I didn't, I, I didn't get involved. Maybe it was wrong on my part, but I didn't get involved with those at all. <clears throat> um, 
Well, ever since um, all the stuff with Grappy, uh, uh -huh. Father Jim, rather. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> how much do you think? Uh, how much do you think Milwaukee has changed since then? Well, <clears throat> from my point of view, I think it has changed <clears throat> for the better. Possibly, we have. I have a black family living up the block. I got some living here. You never saw that years ago. It's not, you might say, uh, totally integrated, but it, it, it's become uh, much more integrated. Some people say, no, well, I don't know. Bayview High School, where we have the busing, I would say it's predominantly black there practically right now. And, uh, and you see a lot. You can go into local taverns. There's blacks and whites, everybody. You know, you never saw this years ago. At our store, when we had the Seaway open up, and a lot of these guys just come up from Mississippi or Alabama or Louisiana, I can rattle off a bunch of names of all of them. I got to know pretty, pretty close. And uh, like I said, we cashed all their checks. I had them on the books at the store, at the store you know, and they'd pay. One guy came in, check, Joe Riley, I'll never forget him. His check, here, he says, you hold this for me, he says, I'll cash it tomorrow, but don't cash it for me today. He must have either owed somebody money or he was afraid he'd spend it in a tavern or something like that, you know. They trusted us, and we trusted them for the main part, and uh, they paid their bills. But my pa, he grew up, and everybody in the neighborhood owed us money, and my pa was very generous, took care of all of them, you know. He had them on the books, and a lot of them weren't paid, but there was always enough to feed us, and so that's the way he looked at it. He used to donate food to our parish over here. And one time, oh, this was way back. My modern daughter must have been seven or eight years old. A bishop came back to Milwaukee. He was down in Florida, but his first assignment was here at Immaculate Conception with Bishop Tanner. And he came up here. And he was t at our. Re we had a, a little thing going on in the in the church in a school basement, a big breakfast or whatever it was. And he started mentioning about my pa, what he did for the neighborhood. And he says how he used to send over cases of eggs and food to the nuns over here and everything else. And so uh, it made me feel real good, you know. So pa taught us well, my mom and pa. They were good people. They're both upstairs for sure. <laughs> so uh, what were we talking about, Colin? I forgot. <laughs> I probably interrupted you. We were, we were just kind of... Oh asking like how Milwaukee has changed. Oh, it's changed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, I would say it's changed. Uh, some people say no. But I think it's changed, and uh, I, I can see more, uh, uh, you know, a mix of people. We've got a lot of Hispanics in here now. That's all over, all over the city. And, well, I grew up with quite a few Mexicans and good friends. But now I, I think it's changed somewhat. But now I, I'm... I don't get out over the city anymore. I stay here. You know, I'm around my house or walking down a lake or whatnot, but you go to South Shore Park, there's blacks and whites all over the place, you know, and uh, I, uh, it doesn't bother me. I have no problem. You know, they say, why don't you go down to Potawatomi? A lot of people don't go there because, hey, there's a lot of blacks down there. I say, hey, they don't bother me. I don't bother them. You know what bothers me? All that smoke down there. I can't stand it. I got to get out of there, you know. And uh, those are things, and, uh, you know, it, it's uh, no problem that way. So, uh, and then we got a, uh, <clears throat> our old grade school here. It's a charter school now. Now we got all kinds of people there, too. But uh, as far as, and Bayview is a hot neighborhood for prices. I mean, homes. So I, I don't know, but uh, I don't think it's uh, totally in, uh, integrated. But it's a good start, probably, you know, and so on. Uh, well, I don't know what else to say as far as that goes. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, is there anything in your lifetime that you did that you would go back and, like, do <coughs> over again or something you would change? Change? Well, I think I made a lot of dumb decisions years ago. But as I look back now, as far as my education, I, I could have uh, tried. I mean, I wasn't a smart, but I was intelligent enough, you know, and I, I learned quick and so forth. At high school, it was a breeze, really. Like my brother Jim said one time, going to Bayview was like a, 
like a four-year vacation after coming out of grade school, after Immaculate Conception, you know, because they taught us very good in grade school, and, and it was kind of a breeze there. Maybe I would have tried harder and so forth. I had good grades, but uh, then I went, I went to school for a year, and I just didn't care about school. I was too much involved with the store already, and whether or not, if, if I would have stayed in college or went on, I probably would have been in an office somewhere or this and that, but the people I met, and growing up and whatnot is unbelievable. People I run into today, if they want to know about the neighborhood or what happened to this one, what happened to that one, it comes out. Somewhere it's stored back here and they ask me questions that I, I give them answers for. And uh, Doc Gardetto, a good friend of mine, you know, Tommy, you ought to write a book. I said, no, no, Pete, no. <laughs> but uh, I mean, the people that we dealt with were just unreal. And, and it wasn't just over the counter checking them out. You talked, this, you had a problem. You know, they had a problem, they come, they talked. Geez, they almost come and tell you their life's history and everything else, but it was great. It was uh, something I will never, I don't ever regret working there. You know, it's, uh, I could have done things different. I could have been, uh, I don't know, better. <laughs> you know, and I go to Mass now, I start off with all the apologies. I'm sorry I did this, sorry I did that. I wish I would have done this and that. And then I start thanking them for everything that happened. And, and, uh, but you know, everybody's got regrets of some kind. So we had only one daughter. I, I wish we would have had more, but that's all God sent. So my wife, she came from a family of eight kids. We had 12, we had one. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, you mentioned all the different kinds of people that would come to the doors at uh, the store where, where you were working. Do you have any specific uh, specific experiences that you remember or that stick out particularly? Well, <laughs> this is one experience I'd like to forget. It wasn't from one of our customers, but it was shortly after Halloween, maybe a day or two after anyways. Uh, we had a holdup. My wife was out in New Hampshire with my daughter, she was expecting, and there was myself in the store and uh, one of our young clerks, Amber Rogowski, and, and uh, this was near closing, it must have been close to seven o'clock, and door comes in and here come two guys or two young fellas coming with paper bags over their heads. And I thought it was my nephews. I said, oh, come on, Johnny, come on, you guys, Halloween's over. I looked again, well, uh, I don't know. Anyways, one had a pistol in his hand. I don't know what kind of was, it couldn't have been, it looked real to me anyways. So two of them, Amber was behind the counter and he's got the pistol. I says, Amber, get him the money. Just give him the money and they'll go. Well, anyways, I was standing behind the one guy that had a pistol and he had a, down here on his side, on the right side. And I was behind him. Now I think back, I should have hit that should have taken a jar of pickles and smacked them in the head, but I didn't. I grabbed them. I started fighting with him over the pistol. Well, anyways, he made a lot of noise. Well, it was hard. He was a strong young kid, and I was fighting over it. And my brother Mario came out of the house. He just opened the door at that time and started yelling. And Mario came anyways. We wrestled the guys over towards the front door. And uh, anyways, they ended up going right through the door, the window. The, big the front window, boom, they both went out and took off. I didn't know who they were or what happened to them, but uh, that was the only scare I really had there, and, and uh, that, that'll always stick in my mind. I was lucky, really lucky, whether or not it was a real gun. Making a move like that, like I said, I should have, I was on this side, there were canned goods, there were jars of pickles and peppers. I could have smacked them with one, but uh, I thought I could get the gun, you know. Was there a spit? decisions you make all of a sudden and it turned out we were very lucky <laughs> so but uh, they weren't customers so <laughs> they needed something I would have put them on the books but, <laughs> but uh, yeah aside from that uh, no nah, too many you know you get the big snowstorms and the below zero weather that's when I was out on a truck delivering groceries all over and uh, very interesting. 
Well, one thing we did sell during the <coughs> fall of the year, around September, October, your great grandpa was big in that, was our wine grapes from California. Uh, we used to order them, a friend of ours, he was a sales agent to Mr. Perinkio, he had his relatives, had a big vineyards out there, they were brokers. But we used to get the grapes from them every fall of the year for making wine. Everybody made wine in the neighborhood. So one year after the war, we sold, uh, I think it was seven carloads of grapes, box cars loads, 35 pound boxes of Zinfandel grapes. That was a lot of grapes, that made a lot of wine, but we sold them all over the city, down to Racine, all over the place. And that was a big thing, everybody made wine then. I think you could have 200 gallons, that's four barrels, 450 gallon barrels in the basement. Your great grandpa, go, oh, your, uh, not great, your great, great grandpa, Chano, he, he used to help Louie make the wine, and my pa and everything else. And, oh boy, those were the days, it was a lot of work. And you were out late at night, and a truck, the old Green Hornet, I don't think I have a picture of it here, <coughs> used to pick up the grapes off of Lincoln Avenue down here on a stole station. And he had, uh, do you have any more positive experiences from the store? So, like <coughs> good memories or funny? Well, well, they were all good memories. Oh, most were good memories. I remember the holidays. That's when everybody got stirred up. You know, Easter, Christmas, New Year's, a lot of parties, big, and you know, all the dinners everybody had. But we're in a you know, you're in a retail grocery business, you're dealing with perishable stuff, you know, so you had to be careful what you bought, so forth, and uh, so it was all last minute. Those days before Christmas or New Year's Eve or Easter, you were loaded with work. I had the bakers come into the store at five in the morning with the rolls and the Italian bread, and, and uh, it, it was a lot of work, but it was enjoyable. Somehow you find a little extra around that time of the year. You know, every Sunday morning after Mass, I used to go out to Cardero's Bakery. I'd go to 6 o'clock Mass and go out there, and I'd load up the truck with, oh, man, this is just for four hours on a Sunday morning. Probably about 40, 50 loaves of bread, maybe 80 dozen hard rolls, and some bakery every morning, every Sunday morning, four hours was all gone. So it was, uh, <coughs> Sundays were special too. But, uh, you know, I don't know. It was, uh, it was just a, a life's work. You know, that store was like our living room. You know, you walk from the house, you're into the store, from the house, into the house, store, into the house for dinner or lunch, come back to work. I remember going in a house, my pa would ask me in Italian, hey, Cecente, is are there people in there today? I said, yeah, a little bit, and he'd run back in the store, start waiting on people or whatnot, you know. <laughs> You're eating dinner to get crowded, somebody run a call for you, yeah, you go back in the store. So we learned to eat fast. <laughs> my mother was a good cook, oh man. She made dinner, everybody ate. We had help at the store, they all ate. So, yeah, well. Never went hungry. So <laughs> I think that's about it for me. I don't know. What else you got now? Um, yeah. Well, I mean, obviously you have a bunch of photos right there. Oh, yeah. Right, but uh, the, You know, explaining it kind <coughs> of them to us. Well, there aren't. Uh, there's so many photos. I can't get into all of them. Some there, some here. <coughs> well, here's a picture. A lot of these are pictures of me. All oh, right. Okay. I don't know. You want to look at them? Or I, can, I don't know. What could I say? The picture of me and a dog, my mother and me, and new bathing suit. Oh, here's a picture of our truck. We used to call it the Green Hornet. This was right after the war on VJ Day. Uh, <clears throat> it was full of kids. Mario was driving, and they said it was too dangerous. The cops pulled us off the street, anyways. That was a 1928 Chevy. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, in current times, what do you think is probably uh, one of your happiest memories uh, throughout your lifetime? Right now? 
Well, <clears throat> I think getting married. <laughs> I was a guy who was so shy all my life, you know. The whole family was shy. Uh, <clears throat> then I met my future wife up at a tavern up on the north side anyways, and we got married. She, you know, meeting her was like, uh, when you're shy, it's hard to get out of that shell. I would say my wife, she broke the shell, and I came out, you know, and, and I was very, very different after I got married, you know, more outgoing and so forth, and uh, uh, I would say she was probably the, the turning point in my life right there. Uh, and aside from getting drafted, that was a big deal too, and Father Jim's ordination, all the weddings in the family, we had enough of those. First two married, first two girls married uh, German, the next two married Italian, then the next two married Polish, then I married Italian, and the next one married Polish, so <laughs> we had a mix. Now I look at the family, we've got them from the Philippines, we've got them from Laos, we've got them from all over, <laughs> so it's grown. Uh, you mentioned before that you do come from a very large family with, I believe it was 12 kids. 12 um, kids in our family, yeah. What was it like living in, uh, in a house with so many people around and with a store like oh, yeah. in the next room? Well, it was kind of crowded, although I never realized it. I took it for granted, you know, that somebody slept here, two guys slept here, two guys slept here, the girls were over here. That's why my father had to add on to the house. Those were separate buildings and the last one was added on. But uh, <clears throat> after somebody got married, we did a lot of bed hopping. Somebody moved here, one of the girls moved in with another girl. and I don't know how we did it, but I never felt overcrowded somehow or other. Geez, I think Mario and Louis slept together. I think my brother Jimmy and I slept together. In fact, I think my sister Gloria, when we were real small, all three of us slept together. My pa and ma are in this room. Johnny was in the other room. Eleanor and Teresa were in another room. And then as they got married, the two girls got married, and that emptied one room, and the boys moved into there. And, and uh, uh, that was it. But, you know, I never gave it a thought of being overcrowded or crowded. We weren't always always together in there because some were in the store working, some were out, some were here. You know, it was, uh, I never felt overcrowded, to be honest with you. It was, it was no problem at all. Uh, yeah. Back to your service in the uh, military and how you were drafted, would you have enlisted anyways if you hadn't been drafted? Or no, I, no. No, I wouldn't have enlisted. Uh, we were all drafted. Johnny, Louis, Mario, and I. <clears throat> Most of the neighborhood were all drafted. A few of my friends joined the Navy. Some joined the Air Force. Apparently they didn't like the Army. <clears throat> and, and some ended up in the Marines. A couple of my friends, they, you go down at the an induction center on a day you were drafted, they would look at you and say, this line over here, you go on this line, you go on that line. Some were going in the Marines, some were going in the Army. It was just like that, you know. But uh, we were all drafted into the Army. <clears throat> I went with a lot of classmates. Oh, man. Some of those pictures, I see half a dozen guys I got drafted with. They're all high school graduates with me. And, uh, yeah, it was uh, very interesting. Uh, do you remember what forts you served at? or? What, <coughs> yeah. Uh, well, first I went to Fort Sheridan. That was an induction center. That's where you went first. And from there, they shipped out to where you're going to go to basic training. Some would go to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, or some into Indiana and whatnot. I went to Camp Polk, Louisiana. Uh, uh, it was south of Shreveport. I think the biggest, not biggest, <laughs> the only towns around here were like Leesville and De Ritter, and Monroe wasn't too far. But it was a camp, you know, it was a temporary station. It was activated during the Korean War. <clears throat> but now it's a permanent depot, they call it a fort. So a lot of the fellas that ended up in Vietnam, they all went to Fort Polk, Louisiana. It was uh, interesting, hot. Well, I got there in the summertime. Oh, I couldn't stand the heat. Uh, went down there at the end of May, I think. I came home in October. But boy, it was hot, hard staying awake. Well, they kept you tired, too. 
But then a lot of it was open range at the time too. Actually, cattle were crossing through the base and everything else. And uh, you could see uh, flocks of sheep out there sometimes. And But it, it, was, uh, it was an army base. It wasn't paradise, you know. <laughs> so what are you going to do? Put up with it. Yeah, basic training was okay. You know, you're young, you can do anything. And and uh, it was interesting. I served a lot of good friends down there too. And <laughs> oh yeah. So it was. It was all right. I, I can't knock it. Uh, did you ever have any other scares like the stick up, or did you have any of those at the camp, like threatened attacks, or no, other? no, no, no. No, nothing like that, no. But that, that experience with the holdup, that was enough for a lifetime. lifetime. And so, uh, well, yeah, Father Jim, you know, I don't know if I told you, but when he was a kid, he almost drowned down the lake. He was only 10 years old. He and a bunch of my friends, the guys we all grew up with, they were down, oh, off of Russell Avenue, right down the bottom of the hill. It was all wooden pilings, not like it is today. And one of our dogs fell in, like, King, he went in the lake, and Jimmy was trying to get him out, falling out, and he fell in. He couldn't swim. He was only 10 years old, wearing all his clothes, so he was down on the bottom, and it fell up on the top of the hill by the name of uh, Alex Detloff. He heard all the noise. He came running down the hill, dove in, and fished him up off the bottom, and uh, he saved his life, you know, so it, uh, in fact, when Jimmy was ordained, Alex bought him the chalice for his uh, future, you know, and that was very nice of him. In fact, uh, that Thanksgiving, 1941, it was just before your great-grandpa went in the service, we had a uh, early Thanksgiving and in debt lofts, they were all invited, we had a lot of people there, and uh, in fact, it was around my brother Jimmy's birthday, November 16th, and your grandpa went in the service the 17th, right after that. So it was, uh, it was, we had everybody at the table. And we saved the wishbone off of that turkey until the war ended, you know, to us. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, back to the topic of your military service. How yeah. did Milwaukee change from uh, before you were drafted to after you returned? Oh, well, I don't know if there was a big change then. Uh, this is going back to, I went in in 53, I came out in 55. The only really big change that I saw right away was across street here where they built the Armory Reserve Center. It used to be my ball field. But, uh, and then we had a lot of, uh, <coughs> the Navy base was built also, Russell Avenue. We had a lot of servicemen, a lot of Navy personnel in the neighborhood. But uh, as far as that, every, everything was pretty much stable, you know. In those days, 55, 56, you know, we still played a lot of ball and Saturday nights we were out and so forth. But the Navy base had a lot of personnel down there, and they just filled in the neighborhood, and they, a lot of them stayed right in the neighborhood. They enjoyed it so much, you know, it was something different. Yeah. Um, also on the topic of changes, how do you, um, how do you think Father Jim had a lasting impact <coughs> on, the, on the city and how we do things here? Well, I think he had a lasting impact. He'll never be forgotten, you know, and uh, he was a pioneer in that, you might say, and you'll never forget that. He had an impact on it, definitely. Uh, uh, I don't know. Well, like I said, we went through it before. If it's more, it's integrated more, but not uh, completely. But uh, I think he opened up a lot of eyes on a lot of people. If they, you know, we still have problems, right? I go out I, with a bunch of friends and so forth, and I still hear a lot of dumb comments from them, you know, and so forth, and sound like a bunch of rednecks sometimes. But I, I don't think you'll ever get over that. You know, sometimes people just say dumb things too. But uh, eh, impact, yes, I think he changed the whole city at least to make him aware of what was going on. But you're always going to find crazy things going on, just like up in Baraboo with that picture in the paper and so forth, you know. Uh, kids do dumb things too. So <laughs> I was a kid once, you know. <laughs> but anyways, uh, how it's changed? 
Well, I think, like I said, it made people more aware of what was going on at that time. So what can you do? Uh, did his efforts help to get any laws passed that helped to uh, end segregation? Or to <coughs> oh, sure. Their... Well, the open housing laws and the school segregation and all of that, these have all gone forward, so forth. He had a tough time back then. We had Mayor Meyer was the mayor here in the city, and, and uh, he kept blaming the suburbs for our problems in the city. Sure, but he was... I like to say, I think he was a prejudice to say, come. So, but that's uh, my own opinion there, whether or not he was or not. But they used to go at it round and round. And he had a, you know, well, Val Phillips was the alderman too back then, and she was a big help too with Father Jim. And, and uh, ah, I guess they finally saw their way. But, you know, even on that little picture on the wall there, when, when he, they, they wanted to give him an honor after he passed away, and some of the aldermen walked out at the celebration and everything else, so, yeah. Uh, um, what did he do, what did Father Jim do after his time as a civil rights leader? After the oh, yeah. Well, <coughs> he was married, and then uh, he also was a bus driver, and he drove a city bus, transportation bus. He became the head of the union, too, for the transportation but, uh, yeah, that was his job then, and uh, he did good in it. I had customers in the stores, oh, I met Father Jim on a bus today. He's so nice. Oh, he greets me all the time and so forth. Well, that was Jim. But uh, I think that was the only job he had after that, and then he, then he had the, uh, you know, the, the tumor hit him, and that kind of laid him low. But even in the hospital, I think, uh, who was it, Bishop... Uh, Weakland went up to visit him a lot, and a lot of other priests were up there all the time. And, and like I said, uh, he never left the priesthood, you know. I think he kind of felt that the church, uh, not deserted him, but they didn't back him up any and so forth. And he always said, you know, I should have a little storefront church. I think he would have been happier there. He <laughs> could do his own preaching, whatnot. I said, well, we had a store, a church across from the store, you know. <laughs> oh, boy. So, anyways, I think that was uh, the last thing he did was uh, drive bus. So, but he spent a lot of time, even after he was married, coming to my ma's, to my house over there. and He used to come here. Then when he was sick, my wife and I used to <coughs> go up there and, bring him a lot of stuff for the kids to eat, ice cream and everything else. And, uh, but even there, he was, uh, he was very concerned, too, you know, about his family. So I wish they would have had him around here. Uh, did he ever advocate for any other laws to be passed, or was it mainly just... <coughs> Uh, like fair housing for the black I think that Americans was and yeah more rights and whatever. I think that was basically what it was the open housing and the, and the school segregation and so forth and busing and whatnot but then he also he was involved with the American Indians too you know Native Americans I think I I showed you that picture of him and Marlon Brando when they were up at the novitiate uh, so he got involved with them, but there were, I think there were other tribes up in Canada that also asked for him. And uh, I remember, I don't know if it was, was it Frank Sinatra? Somebody tried to get in touch with him too, but <laughs> I don't recall who it was. But uh, remember, this is kind of, we're kind of going back to the store. Yeah. Kind of. <clears throat> um, did you have any um, significant people? run into the store that oh sure kind of oh yeah well we had uh, <laughs> uh, you know President Clinton was going to stop there one time he was running for office at the time so he and all the FBI agents or whatever it was they were scouting out different places where he was going to stop they came into the store and all his agents or they were FBI I believe whatever you want to call them but they were checking the store out they wanted him to stop there 
Well, anyways, they went through the store. They went through the basement. But we had doors all over the place, basement doors, this and that. Then all the compressors I had there, and I, was, they wanted to fool around shutting that down. I said, oh, geez, I told them. I got enough trouble keeping these units going up here. I, said, I don't want to fool around with that. Well, they were in the store, and the FBI, all these agents, anyways, I'll call them. We had a lot of pictures of sport memorabilia back on the, on the back wall near the register, somewhere of Joe DiMaggio and his two brothers, Vince and Dominic, and, and Babe Ruth pictures and so forth. And these guys wanted those pictures in the worst way. <laughs> I had to keep my eye on them. Anyways, <laughs> they found out there were too many exits and entrances in the store, so they didn't uh, stop there. So I said, okay, fine. So he didn't come. Anyways, that was just one famous group. But we had, a, oh, we had aldermen all the time, the county executive, O'Donnell and whatnot. But one guy was surprised. Come in the store a few times, and I said, I know this guy from somewhere. I think I played ball against him, you know. He had a very, you know, athletic type of a walk or whatever you want to say. Well, he used to come in, and he'd buy prosciutto all the time, like to cut thin and this and that. And came in a few times, and one time he came in with his daughter, well, after he was gone, I asked his daughter, oh, was that your father? I said, who was that? He said, oh, he says, that was Senator Domenici from New Mexico. He was a senator from New Mexico. He was the head of the Senate Budget Committee, but he used to come to the store, and I never knew him at the time. He happened to be Italian. In fact, he was Toscano, too. Had I known that, I would invite him in, go talk to Ma and everything else. But he was... Uh, he, he seemed very nice, you know. His daughter was nice. She lived right on Line Barger. But uh, he'd come in the store and just act like a regular customer and so forth. So, but uh, I think that's about it uh, uh, as far as famous people. Of course, the whole neighborhood is famous. I like them all. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's about it there. Uh, now, now that um, uh, you're all, your family is all older and. Mm -hmm. Some, many of them have retired. Uh, do you still have any contact with the store now? With the store? Well, I go in there almost every day. I meet a lot of old friends in there and uh, old customers occasionally. But it, it's an out. I used to walk there and back every day, you know, morning and night. And, and uh, so now it's just a habit. I go there and pick up a few things here and there. In fact, I brought home some ribs today I had for dinner. And... Uh, but it, it's habit, like I see all the surroundings, I see my family pictures are all over the store and, and uh, <coughs> enjoy it there. In fact, I don't know, did I mention it, that for Thanksgiving, my daughter and son-in-law and one of my granddaughters came in and uh, they wanted to go out to eat. We went to Mass at St. Augustine's in the morning. They wanted to go out to eat earlier while everything was closed. I just come on to the store. Went to the store, we had some of these, what do they call them? sausage or egg McMuffins and all of those, and we had a nice breakfast there. So it was uh, nice reminiscing and so forth. Still meet a lot of old friends there. Most of them are gone. I'm a stranger in the neighborhood now. Years ago, I couldn't walk 10, 15, 20 yards. Everybody knew me or my brothers and sisters. Now I go out, I go down South Shore Park or go to the, the farmer's market down at South Shore Park. I'm a stranger. I don't know anybody down there at all. And, uh, you know, very few, well, mostly young, but very few know me. So I thought, oh, that's all right. I'm okay. <laughs> so, but the neighborhood has changed. Uh, and it's kind of upscale now. Years ago, all working class families, the factories here and there. But now, since they opened the Hone Bridge, you know, it's uh, become another Gold Coast down there. And it, some of these old homes, they tear down and they build a new home, or they, they got the old home and they keep building up higher and higher. Uh, <coughs> South Lake Drive, you know, Superior Street, St. Mary's is gone. They got a, they're building a, a convent for retired nuns and so forth. That's gone. Our alderman Zelinsky built oh, a huge home on a corner of S Superior in Oklahoma. And you go down the lakeside power plant, that's all gone. There's all apartments and condos all the way up and down. It was all farmland then. There there used to be a big farm there. And then across the street, you got the high school. At high school, there was a big farm there where St. Francis High School was. We used to hitchhike to Sheridan Park, go down, there was all farmland. Walk home from there. <laughs> but, uh, hey, it's progress, they tell me. So, what are you going to do? There's more coming. <laughs> 
Well, you guys are young. You're going to roll with the punches. I'm not. I'm stubborn yet. <laughs> all right. Well, well, on the behalf of all of us, we'd like to thank you for your oh. time and sharing all your information with us. That's all right. Anytime. You know, I, I really enjoyed it. I'm not much for interviews. You know, your grand great grandfather, Louis, <laughs> the, we used to get interviewed at the store. Some would come a newspaper, whatever. They want to interview us. Louis said, don't talk to them. They'll foul everything up anyway. They'll write what they want. <laughs> he was right. The <laughs> main part, you know. I've seen so many. Oh, but the stories that were written about this store. I got some, you know, it's off the record, but if you ever want to read them, I've got them here. My pa and Mario when he passed away. And, you know, my brother Mario passed away. Well, you, your grandpa too. He was laid out at, I see it in the church at night. It was packed. And then Beryl was next day. My brother Johnny... And Mario, they were at Shirelles over here on KK. Mario's funeral, man, the place was packed. There was a line all the way around the block and around the corners coming to see him. <clears throat> my wife, too, had a big crowd. All of them. But my father died. That was the first one. Uh, he died in 1956, right after I got out of the service. And the, the funeral, I said, boy, that's the first time I saw old men crying at the funeral. All his old friends the back, you know, they were all up and well at that time in their seventies and whatnot, but they were crying like little kids and it was very moving. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, what can I say? It was a very interesting interview. So Yeah, we'd like to thank you for sharing. That's all right. Anytime. That's good. I'm glad you came over. I uh, I'm not much